Thank you, Steve, for that introduction. It's uh, not like the one I heard about recently, in which a retired minister was asked to come at the last minute to preach at this church, and the person introducing him got up, said, well, we have Reverend so-and-so here, and he looked up in the balcony and he saw a broken window that had a cardboard stuck in to keep out all the weather and the birds and all that. And he said, well, he's kind of like that cardboard piece in the window up there. He's a substitute. I mean, how do you preach a sermon after that kind? Well, he got up and he decided he'd show them a thing or two and he preached one of the best sermons in his life. And the man got up who had introduced him and <clears throat> kind of <clears throat> him on and said, I tell you, he's no cardboard substitute. He's a real pain. Would you bow for a word of prayer? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I have for you today two scriptures. One comes from the Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. And I'll read verses 26 to 34. Would you stand for the reading of the gospel? Jesus also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise day and night and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, and then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with a sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable would we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when... Sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. And yet when it is sown and it grows, it becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in the shade. And our second scripture is from the letter of James. The second chapter, verses 14 through 18. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
there lived in Chicago in the 1930s a man who called himself a businessman, but who most of America knew as a gangster, public enemy number one. The man's name was Al Capone. He virtually controlled everything in the city of Chicago for an entire decade, involving everything from paying off government officials to running bootleg liquor to gambling to prostitution to racketeering and murder. And because Al Capone was very smart, had high intelligence, as well as being very corrupt, he employed a very good lawyer, a man named Easy Eddie. Eddie was such a good lawyer that he managed to keep Capone out of jail for a long time, in spite of the massive amounts of money and the massive number of police officers that had been authorized to specifically bring him to justice. Because Eddie was a good lawyer, Capone paid him very well, well enough that he could afford a huge mansion so large that it in, occupied an entire block in the city of Chicago, filled with every convenience of the day, a full-time staff. Easy Eddie enjoyed a high living lifestyle, and for a long time, it didn't seem to give him second thoughts about the corruption and the evil that he was help supporting. Now, Easy Eddie had a wife that he loved and a son whom he absolutely adored. Nothing was too good for the boy. Easy Eddie saw that he had the best of everything, clothes, toys, education, and when he got older, cars. Despite his own career path, Easy Eddie did his very best to teach his son right from wrong. He wanted him, in fact, to be a better man than he knew himself to be. Yet with all his wealth and power, there were two things that Easy Eddie couldn't give his son. A good name and a good example of real honesty and real integrity. And that bothered him so much that finally he decided to make a very difficult decision. He decided he would rectify the wrongs he had done, and he went to the authorities with evidence that would finally convict Al Capone and send him to prison. But Eddie's decision came with a high price. Capone did not like those who would be disloyal to him. And only a couple of months after Eddie's testimony against Capone, he died in a blaze of gunfire on a lonely Chicago Street. That's story number one.
Story number two is coming later, and then we'll be through. The story of Easy Eddie is a contemporary example of what Jesus talks about in the parable in Mark's gospel that I read moments ago. And it's what the author of the book or letter of James is alluding to today when he talks about the process of faith and works. We're talking about the process of growth. The process that's so mysterious, but a process that in many ways we can affect, sometimes quite profoundly. Now, every one of you who have ever grown a garden or have tried to keep a flower uh, alive on the kitchen window seal knows that you have to contribute something to make that seed grow, to make that flower bloom. We're talking not just about plants but we're talking about the interaction between God and human beings. Faith is the tiniest of all seeds, as Jesus reminds us, but it can mature into an enormous shrub the size of small trees so large that even birds can nest in its branches. And in another version, Yeast, so small, but it can make a loaf of bread enormous, so large that it feeds an entire multitude. But without the planting of that seed in others, or the mixing of that bread for others, just the fact that they are there makes little difference. In his reflection on James, Father William Bruchaw wonders aloud, have you ever wondered who Albert Schweitzer's third grade teacher was? Whether when they taught math, they had any idea what he was going to do with those lessons of multiplication and division and addition? Have you ever wondered about Giorgio O'Keefe or Salvador Dali and who their art teacher was in junior high? That sparked that creative interest who planted that seed, who nurtured it, or who Beethoven's first piano teacher was, or Sarah Chang's first violin teacher, or Ringo Starr's first band teacher, do you suppose they had any kind of imagination about how their words and their attitudes and their teachings and their encouragement would have on that person that would affect the whole society? Now, I'm a real fan of the writings of Garrison Keillor. In fact, every morning I, I get a post on, on, the, on the internet, on, in my email. 
Not long ago, he was talking about doing away with some of his possessions because he had, according to him, had gotten to the advanced age when it was time to get rid of things. But he said, you know, there are certain mementos I will never get rid of. Mementos of family and friends and teachers. And then he goes on to say, When I was in the first grade, Mrs. Estella Schaefer kept me after school every day to read aloud to her. And one day, the janitor walked by, and she said, Listen to him, Bill. Doesn't he have a wonderful voice? I love to listen to him as I grade lessons. Garrison said, Well, it was remedial reading, of course. But she made me believe that I, I had been chosen for this privilege of reading to her. And she changed my life forever. Do you see? That small seed. Planted, nurtured by encouragement, enthusiasm, some years ago, reporters were interviewing Boris Yeltsin and asked him why he had the courage to stand up very firm during the fall of communism in the former USSR. And Yeltsin thought about it a minute, and he said, well, it was an ordinary guy that planted that seed in me, and his name was Lech Luenza from Poland, who had started the downfall of communism in his own country and had inspired Boris Yeltsin to do the same in his country. When on a different occasion, Luenza was interviewed by a different group of reporters, and he was asked who had inspired him in his struggles. And he said it was the civil rights movement in the United States of America under the leadership of Martin Luther King, Jr. Years before, Dr. King was interviewed and asked what had inspired him in his work. And he said it was the courage of one woman, an ordinary African-American woman who worked as a seamstress, whose name was Rosa Parks, who refused to give up her seat and move to the back of the bus. It doesn't seem like too much of a stretch to say that one ordinary, tiny, brave woman in a small, ordinary town in the southern United States brought about the downfall of communism because that's the way faith in action often works. You know, the bottom line for all of us 
is understanding that the grace of God has been planted in we, each one of us. And we have the opportunity to exercise faith. Over our lifetime, you, you, and I touched dozens and even hundreds of other lives every day. When you walk into the convenience store, when you walk somewhere else, when you talk to people, you have an opportunity to change their lives by a simple smile on your face. How are you doing today? Maybe you have more blessings today than ever before. However you do it. But that seed that you plant also has a way of rotting in the ground. Producing not only good, but evil. Hopefully, every seed that we plant is a healthy seed. Because there are some unhealthy seeds, as well as healthy ones. And you know the kind of unhealthy seed we plant, don't you? When we've told someone, oh, you're no good at that. You're not smart enough. Why, you want to be an artist? You'll never be an arna, ar, artist. Or a mechanic. Or a doctor or whatever their dreams were. Hopefully, we'll plant a seed of encouragement and hope and liberation. You can do it. You're terrific at that. I know you're going to make it. Even the smallest seed we plant matters because we never know how it's going to grow. The good father tells a story about Jesus who had just arrived to heaven after all the time on earth and not surprisingly a whole host of angels greeted him. Finally, one got brave enough to say, well, who on earth is carrying on what you have begun? And he said, oh, just a tiny group, tiny group of men and women. And another one became a brave soul and said, is that all? Just a tiny group? What, what if they fail? Your whole mission will be lost. What, what if they fail? And Jesus replied, I don't know. I don't have any other plans. We, my friends, are a part of those plans. We can make it succeed or fail.
Now for the second story I promised you. It comes from the South Pacific during World War II. Stationed there on an aircraft carrier called the Lexington was a young lieutenant commander named Butch O'Hare, who was a fighter pilot. And one day, O'Hare's squadron was sent on a mission, only this time, unfortunately, when he was already in the air, he looked down, checked his fuel gauge, and realized that someone had forgotten to top off the tank. It meant he wouldn't have enough fuel to complete the mission and make it back to the ship. So his squadron leader told him to return to the carrier immediately, and reluctantly, he dropped out of formation to head back to the fleet. And as he was returning, he saw in the distance a squadron of Japanese aircraft coming toward the American fleet. And since there were no other fighters in the area, all had gone on the mission that he was ordered to leave. He knew that the fleet would be defenseless. He knew he couldn't get back to the squadron in time to save the fleet, so he did the only thing that was possible to do to divert them from the ships, he flew straight into their formation. He charged into their midst, firing his machine guns, damaging as many of the Japanese planes as possible before he ran out of ammunition. And then he continued the attack by diving at the other planes, hoping to maybe clip a wing or a tail to damage their ability to fly. Actually, in all the process, he downed five enemy aircraft. Finally, and somewhat surprisingly, the Japanese fighters took off in another direction. And more surprisingly, O'Hare and his tattered fighting machine, his airplane, somehow made it back to the ship, and he landed safely. Well, you know, his act of heroism became instant news because they had developed, quite recently to them, cameras that were on the airplane, that were actually on the guns of the airplane, that could film some of the action. Now, some of us were old enough, well, not many of you, but some of us are old enough to remember the black and white newsreels, you know, that came before the, the feature. Well, this was one of the early newsreels, and it ran in almost every big theater as the main attraction, or before the main attraction, and it showed some of his heroics. When he came on leave, he was invited to the White House by President Roosevelt, and he received the highest honor in this country, the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was the first naval aviator to do so. Sadly, one year later, Butch was killed in aerial combat 
in another location at the age of 29 years. His hometown of Chicago honored him by naming their airport after him. So the next time you fly through O'Hare, you might stop between Terminals 1 and 2 and see Butch's Memorial and the Medal of Honor. And you might reflect on the fact that Bruce O'Hare was Eddie, Easy Eddie's son. A seed planted so small, so small, grew because Easy Eddie in his last days nurtured and encouraged and planted a seed. Thanks be to God. Amen.